So this is basically a continuation of my video where I was talking about the Mormon Church uh, brainwashing people. Um, there are quite a few things that I just didn't think to mention or didn't have time to mention that I would like to mention. I'll probably make a few more videos on this subject, but uh, um, at any rate, just looking up uh, common definitions of what a cult is and what kinds of activities that they engage in. Uh, I'd like to share that and I'd like to show how I think that that the LDS Church is, uh, does this. <clears throat> so, first, people are put in physically or emotionally distressing situations. I don't believe that there are very many times in the Mormon Church where you're put into physically distressing situations. They don't torture you, they don't deprive you of food or water, uh, they don't, they don't um, well, I suppose there are pioneer treks where you might be, you might be physically distressed, but uh, anyway, I think the emotional distress is the big part. I can't tell you, I don't anything in my life. I can't think of a single thing in my life that is more emotionally distressing than having to go to my bishop and confess to him sins that I have done. Um, especially, especially when it's sins that are basically just acting on natural desires that my body has. For example, uh, looking at pornography and masturbating. Those are the two biggest things that I ever confessed to my bishop. In fact, as far as I can remember, that's all I ever confessed. Because everything else, yeah, I made mistakes and I do uh, bad things, but everything else is um, a lesser sin. You're not, you don't need to confess it. You just kind of repent on your own. Anyway, it was very distressing for me. It was so I was I was emotionally distraught the whole time I was in the Mormon church as a teenager and adult because I was worried about overcoming this desire to masturbate and to look at pornography. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go too much into that detail for this video, just pointing out confession is certainly one of the big emotional distresses that the church puts on its members, and, and I think it does this for control, to, to guilt the members, to, to keep them coming back and saying, you need, you need to feel bad about this and you need to come to the church for fixing this. Guilt, you know, we can, we can alleviate the problem. Well, they're the ones instilling the problem. Now that I'm no longer a Mormon, I don't feel guilty about masturbating. And so there's no emotional distress, so I don't have to go to the church to repent for it. Uh, it's natural, and it's, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not harming anyone. Anyway, number two, their problems are reduced to one simple explanation, which is repeatedly emphasized. I can't tell you how obvious the LDS Church does this. It is so obvious. The new training that they have for their missionaries, we didn't, we weren't quite this extreme when I was a missionary, but still we were. Um, but the, the new training that they're teaching missionaries now with the Preach My Gospel manual is resolve all concerns using the Book of Mormon. The logic is, if the Book of Mormon is true, then Joseph Smith was a prophet, then the church that he created was a true church, then everything that the church says is true, then whatever your concern is, is resolved, because you know that it's the Word of God. Every single problem, somebody has a concern, maybe they heard from a friend, that Mormons teach that you can become a god in the next life. Well, that's true. And the missionaries would say, do you have a testimony of the Book of Mormon? Have you read about it? Have you prayed it about it? Not read about the Book of Mormon, read the Book of Mormon. Don't read any other sources because <laughs> the church doesn't want you to know. Anyway, 
that's that's their tactic. They say, read the Book of Mormon, pray about the Book of Mormon, get a testimony about the Book of Mormon. If you know that's true, you know everything else is true. It's the same one simple explanation, and everything comes back to that. And it's repeated over and over in every lesson I taught with the missionaries. They would emphasize, do you have a testimony of the Book of Mormon? Did you read the Book of Mormon? Did you pray about it? Do you know that it's true? That's They would repeat over and over and over. And that's what they would, I know because I went to their zone conferences, so I know that's what they were taught in their trainings. I was with them. I mean, I would go out with the missionaries multiple times every week. Sometimes I would go out with two or three different sets of missionaries in the same day. I was with missionaries all the time. I know what they teach. And, and I know what they teach at church. I know what they teach in Sunday school and in sacrament meeting and in the priesthood and relief society meetings. It's repetition. It's you need to pray and get your answer, and it's a simple explanation, and everything, everything relies on that. Number three, they receive what seems to be unconditional love, acceptance, and attention from a charismatic leader or group. Well, a couple different charismatic leaders. First of all, there's God. We're taught, you're taught that God loves you unconditionally. God will watch over you and care for you no matter what in your entire life. But even then, they have uh, Thomas Monson. I can't say whether he's charismatic. I, I think he is. I think he's very good at telling stories. I think he's very likable. Um, but at any rate, uh, the point is, you're taught that he's the prophet. He's the prophet of God. As God's prophet, he loves you. And he wants what is best for you. Uh, in an email I just got from my dad the other day, he said, I know that all of the general authorities of the church and the local leaders of the church only want what is best for the people that they serve. So you're taught they love you unconditionally and that all they want for you is what is best. Four, they get a new identity based on the group. Now, Mormonism is very good at this. Uh, there's a very strong Mormon versus non-Mormon identity. You think of your fellow Mormons as brothers and sisters, and <clears throat> and I think it's relatively common knowledge that BYU graduates look out for each other. Like, if you're a BYU graduate and you go apply uh, for work, you want to go to apply to a place where a BYU alumnus is waiting, I mean, is there. They're the person that's doing the hiring, or they know someone that's doing the hiring, and they can have an in for you. Because you're Mormon, and they're Mormon, and they're going to watch your back. And if that's not enough, when you go to the temple, you literally get a new name. You get a name. It's not your own name. It's not your first name or your last name. It's a new name that you're supposed to use when you get to heaven. And there's a new identity right there. Number five, they are subject to entrapment, which means isolation from friends, relatives, and the mainstream culture, and their access to information is severely controlled. Now, this is the one that I think the Mormon Church probably doesn't do nearly as much as other cults, and that's probably why they try to defend themselves and say they're not a cult. That's probably why... Mormons get really defensive when you say that they are a cult. You, you can talk to your friends. You can talk to your relatives. You can associate with people that aren't Mormon. It's not as strict as some other cults. Some other cults I understand. I don't know. I haven't had any personal um, experience with other cults. But I, I hear that some other cults literally will not let you see anyone that is not a member of the cult. And, and I'm sure that would be much more distressing. But the Mormon Church does have their policies. They say you should not read anti-Mormon literature. You should not associate with, like I said in my last video, you should not associate with or affiliate with any group or individual whose teachings are contrary to or oppose those established by the LDS Church. So, yes, 
you, you are subject to entrapment. You're not entitled to look at the other side of the story. You're not entitled to go read what other people have to say about the church. You're only supposed to listen to what the church itself says about itself. And just another random thought. Um, I was thinking about how uh, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on how uh, testimony sharing is um, brainwashing. So I, I teach math. Let's just suppose, I don't, I teach college, but let's suppose that I teach first, second grade math. I teach arithmetic to children. How do I get my children to learn, uh, for example, the multiplication table? If I want them to learn everything up to 10 times 10. Memorization. That's the, that's the only way. They're just going to have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So why is repetition bad in one case, good in another case? Is it brainwashing in one example, but in another example it's an effective teaching tool? Well, there are a couple reasons. First of all, arithmetic is accepted as true by the entire population. Nobody disputes that arithmetic is valid. People do dispute religion all the time. So first of all, it's established truth compared to uh, one person's version of the truth, one person claiming that such and such is true. Uh, another thing is, teachers don't indoctrinate students. They don't say, you cannot look at other sources. You cannot look at any other place that talks about arithmetic other than this classroom. They don't do that. If you want to go look at other th sources for arithmetic, go for it. Every source you look up will tell you the same thing. Every one you look up, 2 plus 3 is 5. Every single one. You look anywhere you want to. And also, if you think that it's wrong, you think 2 plus 3 should be something other than 5, well, you know what? Come up with a reason why you think that. Share it with the world, and then maybe you can come up with, your, you can design your own version of arithmetic. Great! Do it! Nobody's going to try to stop you. That's, that's the big difference right there. The LDS Church, if you do that, you try to come up with your own version of the truth, they're going to stop you. They're going to say, no, you're wrong. You're wrong, you're wrong. You have to do what we say. We have to do it our way. As a math teacher, I, I don't make my students do things my way. I just tell them, you know, I'm teaching you this, and if you want to learn it, great. If you don't want to learn it, that's your choice. You know, you can go somewhere else and learn something else if you want. I'm not going to try to control you. You think whatever you want. You think whatever you like about math. The church actually demands that you love the church. You have to love God, you have to love the gospel, you have to love the Book of Mormon, you have to love your brothers and sisters in the church, you have to, your emotions are controlled. And in fact, that's why the testimony sharing is so dangerous. See, when, when you're memorizing your multiplication table, and you're, you're just sitting there and you're going, okay, two, four, six, eight, ten, you just list it all off. You're not sitting there going, and I know that this multiplication table is true, and this multiplication table brings me joy. And knowing that 2 times 5 equals 10 brings me a fullness of joy, and I am so happy that my math teacher taught this to me, and he is so loving and caring that he would teach me the multiplication table. If you find a math student like that, I want them in my class. I really do, because I don't think such a one exists. I love math. I love math, and I'll talk about it all day long. I'll say math is wonderful, math is great, math brings me joy. But I'm not going to indoctrinate anybody else. I know other people don't like math. You don't like math? That's fine. I expect that you don't like math. Don't like math. Cool. Like something else. Like art. Like uh, video games. Whatever, you know, whatever it is that interests you. Reading. TV. Sports. Great. That's fine. But the church, you know, in the church, you have to say, I love God. 
I love the Book of Mormon. I love my family. I love my brothers and sisters. And and I'm grateful for this truth, and this, this truth brings me joy. And I know that math is true. But I don't go around all day long saying, I know math is true, and math brings me joy, and it's so wonderful to have math in my life. I don't need to do that, because I know it's true. I have confidence that it's true, so I don't have to go around telling everyone that it's true. The reason why you're going around telling everybody that your testimony, that you know the Book of Mormon is true, and that you know that God lives, and all of these things that you're testifying of, in any religion, Mormon other or otherwise, I think it's a sign that you're trying to convince yourself. In fact, in fact, Boyd K. Packard gave a very famous talk, most Mormons know about it, it's called The Candle of the Lord, and in that talk he said that a testimony is found in the bearing of it. I mean, he even admits that all you're doing when you're bearing your testimony is convincing yourself of what you're actually saying. You might not believe that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, but if you say it enough times, you will believe it. Say it every week. Say it every month in, in sacrament. Go up in front of 500 people and say, I know that the Book of Mormon is true, and after you've done that 55,000 times, I guarantee you will believe the Book of Mormon is true, regardless of what's written in it. I mean, it could be stuff that is clearly and demonstrably false. It could be talking about how uh, the earth is flat. They could mention that. And then you believe it. Because you've said over and over and over again that you believe that it's true and that this belief, this truth, brings you joy and brings you happiness. So I think that's the big difference between the repetition involved in actual teaching and the repetition involved in brainwashing. In, in the actual teaching, you're just, you're just memorizing facts. Uh, 2 plus 2 is 4, 2 plus 3 is 5, 2 plus 4 is 6. You know, the Battle of Waterloo was, I don't even know what year, I don't like history. You're just memorizing facts. You just this huge long list of things and you just recite them over and over. Yeah. But you're not trying to convince yourself that it's true. You're not trying to associate emotion with what you're learning. You're just like, okay, yes, the uh, French Revolution happened uh, during the reign of uh, Louis the Sixteenth, or whenever it was. I don't know. The, that's it. You don't have to say, I know that King Louis was the king when the French Revolution happened. And I know that Robespierre was a true revolutionary. And I am so grateful for the teachings that he gave his people uh, because it brings me joy to read about what he wrote. No! You don't have to work yourself up into a frenzy. You don't have to work up these emotions and say, I feel this spirit. I feel this Holy Ghost. I feel this. I know this is true in my bones, in every fiber of my being. No. I mean, I have no doubt that math works. I've been doing math exclusively for... I mean, I haven't done anything other than math, really, since 2006. Uh, and and even before that, I mean, I mean, I've been significantly interested in math ever since about eighth grade, and I've been studying it aside from just what I would learned in my middle school and high school classes. I would learn, study it on my own, and, and yes, I, I have a passion for math, and, and I love math. I've learned it, but I'm not indoctrinated in math because one person may. Uh, may have one conjecture and say, I think that, you know, this is true, and I'm going to try to prove this. You know, something hasn't been proven yet. I'm going to try to prove this. And somebody else will say, well, I think you're false, and I'm going to try to prove you wrong. Well, that's fine. Nobody's going to cry about it. They're just both going to work and work, and maybe one of them will prove their point, and, and then they'll both know the truth. Uh, well, then the whole math community will know, because they'll publish it. Great. 
Uh, but there's no math dictator. There's nobody that says this is the true math and everybody has to believe this. If that's the way math worked, uh, it would be garbage. In fact, there was a time when that happened, and it was called the Pythagoreans. Pythagoras had his own cult. He had a cult, and it was based on math. And he had his people believe in all sorts of weirdness, cosmology, numerology, and all this kind of stuff. And every number had a symbolism. Three meant something, and, and five meant something, you know. And, and men were superior to women, of course, obviously. And you couldn't eat beans because they resemble testicles. And all sorts of crazy stuff. And, and I think that's the biggest problem with a cult is you're isolated. You have the inside and then you have the rest of society. And inside, you're only allowed to think and do and say the things that people inside the cult think and do and say or what you're told to do inside the cult. You're not allowed to think outside the box. And so it, is it further isolates you from the rest of society. The rest of society progresses. They learn stuff. And then inside, you're stuck in here, and, and you can't learn anything that's not inside your little cult. Because you're told not to. You're told, don't go looking at anti-Mormon sources. Don't go looking at, at pages that, that disagree with what we say. That's the opposite of learning. When you're trying to learn something, you need to look at both sides. You need to say, well, this person's saying this over here, and this person's saying this over here. Who's right? Figure it out. Uh, you have a brain, you have intellect, you have knowledge that you've learned before. It, work it out. Say, you know, why is why are these two people disagreeing with each other? People disagree. That's that's the whole point of freedom. The whole point of freedom of of religion, freedom of belief, freedom of having your own opinion, freedom of saying your own opinion, the freedom of speech. There's no dictator that says you must believe this. You must believe that there's one God and one Son and one Holy Ghost, and you must believe that Joseph Smith translated the golden plates from Reformed Egyptian into a English. You don't have to believe just because somebody says so. Research. You know, if you don't believe archaeologists, go to the site where they dug this stuff up. Look around for yourself. Go look at the, you know, the, the findings that they have in their museum. Go to the museum and see what they dug up and look at it yourself. Uh, you know, I mean, if you don't think dinosaurs are real, go look at all the fossils that they've found. They're there. Uh, you don't have to take anybody's word for it. Be skeptical. And figure stuff out on your own. And and that's, that's the opposite of what a cult wants you to do. A cult says, you must agree with me. You must believe what I say. And that's what they do in the Mormon church. You have to believe specific doctrines, and, and you have to live according to these teachings. And, and then you have to work yourself up into a frenzy of emotion. You have to say, I feel joy when I go to church. And you have to keep convincing yourself. And they even say, fake it until you make it. All the time at church. And you have to enjoy home teaching. You go home teach. You go into somebody else's house. And you sit down and you talk to them about the church that both of you already attend. And maybe you don't like it. Maybe they don't like it. Maybe they just want to have a relaxing evening at home. But here you come in and then you just go and you're supposed to pretend that you like it. And they're supposed to pretend that they like it. And then you keep pretending and pretending and pretending. And then maybe eventually you've convinced yourself that you do like it. And you're working yourself up into this frenzy of emotion. You're convincing yourself, I feel joy. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel happiness. I know that this is true because I have warm bubblies inside. And that's not how you learn. That's not how you learn. That's how you isolate yourself from real knowledge. The way you learn real knowledge is to go out into the world and read study, uh, learn, Let's see what's out there. 
Talk to people that disagree with you. Anyway, I'm done rambling.